It's time to take a ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome into another episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith. That is Alan Saunders. Alan, what's going on? What's up? What's up? Uh, it's uh, it's a big week. It'll be a big episode tomorrow. We'll tell people a little bit more about that later oh, in we're this excited. episode. Our 10K celebration is tomorrow. Fired up about that. It's the bye week. Fired up about that. I'm sure y'all aren't, but I am. <laughs> I got my hair cut. I bought a new pair of shoes. I feel like an adult oh. human being instead of like a reporter gremlin as like I normally am who like just mm-hmm. works, eats and sleeps sometimes. Yeah. Um, the difference in, in, you know, yesterday we talked about this. We touched on the defensive side of the ball. We're going to talk some offensive stuff today, but this is the week where assistants, you know, position coaches, stuff like that are available. Um, the one time this season. So obviously getting the opportunity to talk to those guys. Um, I think we just kind of dive into that side of the football. We do have a really funny clip from Matt <laughs> Canada too, that we can play at some point is, uh, if you, you are a, go there first, I think we should go there. go there. Yeah. Or, I mean, we were cracking up like <laughs> listening to it and now I have the visual as well to go along with it. Cause I just had the audio before, but, uh, if you are also a Pittsburgh Penguins fan, or even if you're not, I'm sure the video has made its rounds penguin fans, uh, at PPG paints arena, starting a fire Canada chant during the Penguins home opener against the Chicago Blackhawks last night. Matt Canada was asked about that today. Here's what he had to say. Matt, with the chance against you now rolling into another sport, do you have a message for the fans that are saying that? I do not. I do not. I do not. I just, <laughs> Very I in-depth that, answer from Matt Canada. I, it cracks me up. I don't know. Like, what's he supposed to say there? I don't know. Like, There's no... And there's no right answer, uh, and and it was a poorly worded question, and that you're not supposed to give them the out of like saying that they don't have something to say. You you know what I mean? Uh, like instead of saying like, "Do you have a message?" You should say, "What is your message?" And then like, you know, no doesn't become the answer to the question anymore. But I just find the interaction comical. That's all. Yeah, uh, I, I was waiting for him to be like, yes, Penguin fans, can you please stop doing this to me? I, I hear it enough from 70,000 people on Sundays. Can we not or, let it in? Just, like, just be like, yeah, man, fire me. I don't give a shit. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to go on, go and hang out on the beach. I, I live on the beach, here. man. So, like, you want to fire me and pay me to not work? I'm also cool with that. <laughs> man yeah that that would have went over real well too if that was his response uh i don't misrespect it the honesty if that's what he were to have said um but let's let's dive into this a little bit more we've talked so much about matt canada i almost want to talk about the other stuff the other coaches yeah very little today. i mean like i was there for all canada's uh availability i very little to to add that i felt like was important from what he had to say to be honest um it's you know he he broke down you know the the increase in Kenny being able to and you know being willing to make some changes at the line of scrimmage but nothing you know groundbreaking that, that we didn't already know and uh you know it was, a, it was a lot of generalities there not not a lot I feel like we needed to talk about from Matt Canada but I talked to Eddie Faulkner running backs coach I talked to Pat Meyer the offensive line coach and I feel like I did get kind of a good read on what they think is going wrong with the running game and maybe how they can fix it and then Mm. i I do i do want to have a conversation about kenny a little bit and just where we think he is uh, compared to where he could be and where maybe we thought he would be okay so does that conversation in terms of you know the, the running game the issues with it what we could see more of so you know yesterday we talked about changes that we could see from the defense during the bye week and the bye week is a nice week to kind of reset, do some self scouting, see what you're doing well, see what you're not doing well, maybe throw some stuff out, say, this is what we're going to really lean into and rely on. Is that kind of what you're talking about in terms of the run game? Like they're, they're self scouting, realizing, Hey, this is going well. Hey, this isn't going well. Yeah. A little bit, you know, two, two part, two big parts of the conversation. One is the, how much and how and when to use Najee Harris versus Jalen Warren. I feel mm-hmm. like it's still something they're working on. Like we talked about the inside linebackers yesterday. You know, anytime you have more than one guy at a position 
it's going to fall on the position coach and, and the coordinator to come up with the right mix of when to use which guy and what kind of things you want to do with each guy. And while we've seen some success from the Steelers running game, I just don't feel like they've quite cracked the code in terms of how to use Najee Harris and Jalen Warren in the most possible complementary way to this point. And, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot, and we saw that game, this, this last week's game, where Jalen Warren really felt like a spark for that team in the second half, yeah. um, both as a runner and as, as an outlet in the, in the passing game. And it kind of like, that, that kind of kicked some things around in my head, where like, the Steelers have mostly been using Najee Harris on first downs and second downs and Jalen Warren on third downs. And then occasionally maybe Jalen will get a couple extra plays here and there. They're playing about 50, 50 in terms of snap count. I think for a team that's been playing from behind as much as they had, I wonder if that arrangement might work better the other way. Like give me the spark plug first and the hammer second. Like let this like they let Jalen Warren play. I I I think the I think the idea that people look at his yards per carry and say, oh, Jalen Warren's just better because like that's that's ignoring the fact that he's running against a defense that's already been dealing with Najee Harris all game, right? It's harder, you know. He, but I think the other way could work too if they could use Jalen Warren in that short passing game, especially get things going quickly, and then use Najee Harris to wear defenses down with a lead. To me, that feels like a way better way to approach it. We've talked a lot about slow starts for this offense. I think he, I think that might work better than the way they've been doing it. And I talked to Eddie Faulkner about that, and he basically said. It could it could work either way that they 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 feel that either back can really do anything. It's just about the feel of the game, about who's hot at that moment. But I think there's a way that they could use Jalen Warren earlier in games and and leave Najee Harris's contributions for later with the idea that they would have a lead that he could help them protect. Yeah, and just from like a predictability standpoint you know throwing Warren out there on earlier downs could throw some defenses off and not know what they're going to do and you know I know that Jalen is the better of the two in terms of receiving um but like Najee's capable you know I feel like you could throw Najee out there sometimes in what looks like it might be an obvious run situation but have him catch some passes like just from a predictability standpoint mixing it up when those two are on the field could work to their benefit too I also think they need to play together some more you know I, yeah. I think there's there's, uh, especially with Deontay Johnson and Pat Fryermuth out, those two guys are definitely in their top five eligible players. And we did see a little bit of it against the Ravens, but I wouldn't mind seeing a lot of it. I'd come out there with two running backs as like the base offense one of these weeks just to see what somebody does against it. Because I think, I, I think they're, they're just, that's among their best players. Like the, there's no... Outside of George Pickens, there's no other player on offense I would rather have the ball than Harrison Warren in whatever order you want to put him in right now. Yeah, well, with it, it's, we are on track to get Deontay Johnson back for that Rams game, though. But I, I still agree, like, you know, Allen Robinson, Calvin Austin, I don't know. I mean, actually, I want to ask you a question about Calvin Austin. I know that he he left the game for a little bit on Sunday and came back, but did he even have a – did he have – oh, he had targets. He just didn't have a reception. Um if you went back and watched that game, what was what, going on with Calvin Austin on Sunday? He got shaken up. I don't think he was playing at a hundred percent. Didn't really look very good. Seemed to minimize him as the game went on more and more. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's always going to be a concern with a guy, his size of just yeah. how he's going to deal with contact. I didn't even see, I went back and tried to look. I never even saw how he got hurt. I, I still don't even know how it happened. I think it might've been on the, like was he on the field for the kickoff return? I, I don't know. It was weird. Well, that's um, that's when I noticed it was when he wasn't on the field for a return, and I was like, oh, okay. So I I don't know, maybe, but uh, yeah, I, I just I thought about that because I was bringing up their best eligibles, you know, including yeah. the running backs. Uh, but I agree. I think they both should be on the field more. Um, in terms of the offensive line with Pat Meyer, uh, that's part of this too. Obviously, the the run game starts in the trenches. And what was that conversation like? What were the things that he was talking about? So he was kind of talking about their inability to have 
plays that they always feel good about. You know, mm. when you're, I consider this to be one of the sort of classic football dilemmas, right? Where every week, every football team has to balance what they're good at versus what their opponent is not good at. You know, like yeah. that, that is always a balance. If you're playing a team with the worst passing defense in the league, but you are the worst passing offense in the league, should you throw the ball 30 times or never? You know, like that's that's the 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 dilemma, right? Like they're bad at this, but so are we. So should we take advantage of their weakness or should we instead play to our strengths? And I think the Steelers have done a pretty nice job of scheming their runs for opposing weaknesses. Like we've seen a large variety of running plays in in their in their scheme far more than we've seen in their passing game which is you know been been sort of chronically mm-hmm. simplified their running game is is everything in the book and you know we saw them go to the trap game against a Texans team that likes to jet the gaps and then we saw them go to like crack toss against a a Ravens team that prefers to two gap and i think they're doing a good job in those instances of finding new wrinkles each week to get their running game going. And those have been the plays that are working. What they don't have is a, what do we do good? Like what do the Steelers Mm -hmm. do well? And I think that's week in and week out. That's what they're missing. And I think that's what they really need to spend this bye week identifying is like, what runs does it not matter what the other team does? We can execute. And I'm not really sure they have an answer to that. Part of it is changing personnel. It's difficult, right? Like what they were good with Dan Moore and Pat Fryermuth might be different than what they are with Broderick Jones and Darnell Washington. But they've got to come up with at least a few running plays that they feel like can just be consistent winners for them that they, they don't feel like they have right now. And I think that's the biggest problem with the running game for the Steelers at, the, at this current moment. And Alan, I, I don't want to single out just one guy, but how much of that do you think falls on the play? I, I'm not saying he was like excellent last year, but he was pretty steady of Mason Cole this season. I think in general, the interior of the offensive line really felt like an area where the Steelers could make a huge improvement from last year. And I'm not sure we've seen much of any improvement, you know, despite replacing Kevin Dotson with Isaac Samalo, despite Mason Cole being healthy this year when he was not healthy all last year, it's it's not been much better. Um, a little bit better in pass protection, I thought, um, until Daniels got hurt, and maybe now a little bit better run blocking with, with Herbig in there, but they've not been consistently better across the three spots in the interior. I don't think there's anything wrong with Isaac Samalo. Like there's some chemistry stuff that like there was, they had some problems against the Browns passing stunts. Like that's a chemistry thing, you know, that, that, that mm-hmm. takes time to develop. I'm not super surprised by that, but I, I just thought this could be an above average offensive line this year. And it has not been, uh, I think the play of Cole has been probably the single most disappointing part of it. But, you know, Chooks is kind of who he is at this point. I'm not really surprised by what they've gotten from him. He is banged up also. But, you know, he's a good pass blocker and not a good run blocker, and that's what he's going to be. Uh, I thought Dan Moore did okay considering the level of competition the first three weeks. And honestly, I was really impressed with what they got from Broderick Jones. But to me, the interior of the line is where they should be better than they've been, and especially considering, like, okay, Cleveland's interior is improved than it has been that that – could be a good interior group. Eric Armstead is obviously very good, but since week two, they haven't played an above average defensive tackle. And and they still have not gotten consistent push up the middle in the running game. I think that's really concerning. And that really does limit the number of things you can feel like you can be good at. Yeah. And, you know, you look at the interior, we've seen Nate Herbert there the last two weeks. Looks like, you know, James Daniels could probably be back post by for that Rams they game. They practiced yesterday. Uh, I would assume that we will see James Daniels against the Rams. You know, how much do you think that could change things, him getting back into the lineup? 
Well, he's got to play better than he was. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. It's like if they just get the James Daniels back there the first couple of weeks, it's not really that much of an improvement. Um, you know, maybe you trade a little bit better pass protection for a little bit worse run blocking, but not overall better. They have not had any offensive lineman really just play good two-way football, period, all, all year. And and it's absolutely uh, – if you consider line, the line as one unit – uh, it's it's among the biggest problems on the entire offense. You know, we've talked a lot about Canada. Kenny Pickett, obviously, is the topic of conversation, but I think the offensive line is right there in terms of reasons why this is an offensive line that ran, or this is an offense that ranks in the low twenties at almost everything in the NFL. Yeah, and uh, you know, broad. You mentioned Broderick. I Like you, I was also very impressed um, with his performance against the Ravens because this was a guy. And I'm not saying it's not going to happen. You know, he's a rookie tackle. I'm sure he's going to take his lumps at some point. But I'm just surprised that it didn't happen in his first career start. Like that, he was very bad. Um, I'm not saying like I. I'm obviously happy that he wasn't, but I thought that he could get out of the gate and be pretty rough in his first career start. And I just didn't see it. I thought he looked like he belonged. No, he looked like he was probably their best offensive lineman last week. Um, honestly, and and mm-hmm. was playing Baltimore's best defensive lineman and Jadavian Clowney most of the time. And so, yeah, I I fully agree. Um, given what I saw in that game, if that continues, I don't see how Dan Moore gets his job back. I just don't. I think That's, you know uh... when he gets healthy, uh, those are the breaks. Sometimes it was probably happening at some point anyway. I, I just can't see how if Rogers Jones continues to play at that level, they can go back to Dan Moore. I, I think uh, he was, he was that good. So, I mean, that's kind of where I wanted to go next because of talking about changes we could see after the buy. Now that's a change that already has kind of occurred because of injury, but Dan Moore, whenever he, whenever he is healthy, we don't know how much he's going to miss anyway, but whenever he was, if, whenever he did get healthy, I was going to ask if he thought he could be inserted right back into the lineup. But of course, you know, if Roger continues to play the way that he has, that change was going to come anyway. Why would they go back to Dan Moore if they continue to get the play they did from Sunday from Roger Jones? Yeah, I just I just don't see it. And maybe we'll see them try Dan at right tackle some or at guard some. I don't know. Uh, I do mm. think, you know, maybe we'll see them play a little more six offensive linemen. They haven't done that much this year. Um, I'd be interested to see what that looks like. But again, when you have Pat Farmuth back, and I'm not sure that's happening this week, um, but when, when F- Pat Farmuth does come back, then you'll have Darnell Washington, who's basically mm-hmm. another offensive lineman anyway. And yeah. so, uh, you know, do you need to play a, a six tackle if you can play Darnell Washington? Um, Pat Fryermuth is, is a guy that I think they have not used very well so far. If they really want to look at things they've done when they get him back, you know, I really think they just need to focus on him being a route runner and a pass catcher and leave the blocking to Washington or Warren, if they're going to go two back or, you know, whatever. Uh, it, it just doesn't seem to be working in terms of putting him in the box to be a run blocker and then running against a loaded box is, is a, is a trade that the Steelers are losing almost every time. And I think they've got to figure out a different way to do it. Uh, one more thing about this offensive tackle situation, then I want to start talking about, you know, the passing game and what we could see post by. But is this, you know, I, I'm trying to think back to times in the past when a tackle has been replaced. Would this be the time, okay, say they do know Roger Jones is is now the incumbent left tackle. That's going to be the case going forward, even when Dan Moore comes back. Would this typically be the time? And I know Dan Moore started to put work in on the right side, but could you see him basically start to focus, like, I don't want to say solely on that, but thinking, okay, the team can move on from shoot to core for after the season. Like, should that be his main focus when he gets back and healthy? Well, I think the first thing is they will just want him to take a bunch of reps at right tackle and practice because he will then be the swing backup. And mm-hmm. I don't know, like yeah. we'll see, like he didn't seem very comfortable at right tackle when they've put him there. So I really do think that he could use some work at right tackle. I think long-term, like I, I think Chooks's contract is, probably not one they're going to want to hang on to um, after this season. And Dan Moore's contract is quite reasonable for a guy who's given them, you know, average to to maybe slightly below average tackle play uh, for a fourth round rookie contract. That's a good deal. And so 
yeah, I think the idea of moving him to right tackle or right guard uh, going forward is attractive because of his salary and his experience. Uh, can he make the move work? I don't know. Uh, yeah. Certainly no reason not to find out, though. And, and yeah, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if we see him on the scout team as a right guard or a right tackle in the next couple of weeks here. I also don't know how severely he's injured. He didn't go on the IR. Yeah, right. But you hear knee sprain, and you're usually not like, oh, he'll be back in a week. You know, that's mm-hmm. that's usually a, a, a couple-week kind of thing. Speaking of knee injuries, uh, Kenny Pickett bouncing back from one very quickly, and that's where I want to talk about next. Obviously, from where he was at the beginning of the season to where we are now, it's kind of been a uh, been a roller coaster, putting it lightly, especially if you want to con- take in consideration training camp in the preseason and all of this and just – focus on all of it in one big scope um where are we at with kenny pickett as we sit here at this moment in time yeah riding the steel phantom that's the, <laughs> that's, yeah that's that's what that's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's uh that's that's where we're at uh it's it has been a roller coaster and uh i think we are where we started we're back at the station that's that's what i feel like okay we, we let we we came into this season and we went up the hill and we said, oh, my God, like Kenny, the ball's coming out of his hand better. The arm looks stronger. Uh, we expected more development. Then we saw in the preseason, everything looked great. And then we got to the season, and it's a 220-foot drop into a ravine at 85 miles an hour in that San Francisco game. And there's been some twists and turns. There's been some dips and dives. And now I feel like we're back to where we were in terms of expectations for Kenny Pickett at the end of last season, which is maybe he could just be a little bit better. You know, I I think we've we've crossed off the idea of him taking this big leap forward and being a different looking player this year. I can't. I'm still not sure why. I'm. I still don't really have a good reason as to why a guy who looks so much better all summer, all spring, and all preseason just does not anymore. But I'm mm-hmm. gonna believe what five games have told me and say that that's probably not gonna happen. The 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 question is, can we just get to a little bit better at this point? Where are you with Kenny and your feelings about him and his future? Do you still think he's the guy? Like, do, do we have an answer to that? Now we're, what, 17 or 18 games in this 10 years of starting quarterback. For anybody watching on for or listening, I should say, this is my reaction, and you're not going to be able to visibly see it, but I have both my hands up. I have no clue how to answer this uh, because it's I just don't know. Like, it, it, he keeps you, he keeps you hanging on because of the, you know, the late game heroics. What he's able to do in the two minute drill, like that clutch factor is there, and that typically is something that is like the last thing to come along for quarterbacks, if it ever does. Some guys never have that ability, so it's almost like if we can just find a way for you know that first three and three quarters of the game to be somewhat close to to get to that point, um, then you have something there, and it's just there's not a lot of guys that can play as well down the stretch as he does. It's just a shame that he's, you know, the, those first 50 minutes happen. Um, me, but that's why I just don't have the answer to it yet. Like, I just, I don't know. I'm going to say this about Kenny Pickett. Yeah. He is begging for a different job, given what he's done so far. If Kenny Pickett was the quarterback of the Tennessee Titans and he could just hand the ball off, 35 times a game and then have two good long scoring drives where he's actually required to do the heavy lifting. One of which late on a team that just plugs and hangs around. I think he would be great. He could be Ryan Tannehill. He could be Jared Goff. Like I really do think that, that he could do that job. The problem is the Steelers offense isn't good enough to do that. They need him to be better than Ryan Tannehill and Jared Goff in order for them to be successful. And I don't think he's there yet. You know, they need Trevor Lawrence. Like, that's what the Steelers need. Like, they they need yeah. Tua, okay? They, they're, they are not getting a bye with Ryan Tannehill and Jared Goff and, you know, the, that type of what Baker Mayfield's done in Tampa. Like, they're, they're not getting by on that. They are not a good enough offense – in general, to get by on good enough quarterback play where they just keep it close, hand off a lot, and maybe you win a drive late. I really think he could be great at that. 
He, I think he's shown that he could be great in that role. The problem is they need, as a team, him to be more. And so far he hasn't. I think that's a tough ask for a young quarterback. And, you know, I predicted at the beginning of the season that the Steelers were going to take a big leap forward, mostly because I thought that Kenny Pickett would. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I no longer believe that to be correct. Uh, and again, I, I, I'm not sure that I know why. But, you know, I was talking before the season with Nick Farabaugh, and he was like, I see what you're saying, but I think they're still a year away. And I think probably if I'm self-evaluating SteelersNow.com right now, five weeks into the season, Nick was five a little weeks. bit more Nick was a little bit more right than I was. And that this offense just does not quite have enough talent around him to absorb the negativity that often comes with young quarterbacks who are just not finished pieces yet that are being asked to have a big role. If you look at some of those guys that I mentioned, if you look at Tua, if you look at Trevor Lawrence, like it's, it's like a lot of like, uh, okay. You you know, like that, that, there's, there's this is a lengthy process for some of those guys that were not complete products when they came in the league to get to where they are. Now, I think the Steelers might, be in for a little bit of a ride in, in the way that the Dolphins and, and the Jaguars were. What's what's interesting to me, and you know, I don't know if you would agree with this, is and I 100% agree that the Steelers need him to do more, but like the way that they've tried to build this team, what they want their identity to, to be, that shouldn't have to be the case. It just hasn't gone well. But like for a team that wants to run the football, clearly like the Steelers do, has tried to rebuild in the interior of the trenches that should be taking the weight off his shoulders. It's just, unfortunately they haven't successfully been able to do that. Yeah, exactly. No, they came out and they upgraded the offensive line and you you got a big blocking tight end. You got a great blocking wide receiver and Allen Robinson. And you figured, Hey, who knows what happens with Kenny Pickett, but we'll be able to run the ball. And as the first half of this show said, that has not been the case. And I think that is, the number one problem when we're talking about this offense and this bye week that they have to figure out, they have to find a way to successfully run the ball, to take some of the pressure and the weight off Kenny Pickett and allow this team to win some games while its quarterback is developing. Um, I, I really think that's, that's too much to talk about the offensive coordinator, not enough to talk about not being able to run the ball, which largely is not the offensive coordinator. It is just the guys doing the jobs up front. Yeah. Um, I do want to, unless I actually, instead of YouTube, I got a DM on X from somebody, yeah. which I wanted to have as the comment today or comment slash question. Um, this is going to be a little bit lengthy, so stick with me here. Hey, really enjoy what you and Alan are doing. Great content. Just wanted to add food for thought, possible topic for an upcoming show. Lately, the noise around Kenny's performance has gotten much higher, myself included. Definitely some doubt if he is the future, but taking a step back, should his level of play be a surprise? Everyone was pretty reasonable about Kenny's ceiling, probably in the 8-10 to 10 range. Think Kirk Cousin, Cousins-ish, which is perfectly fine with a supporting cast and good defense, but you've given him a bottom third off offensive line bottom third run game bottom third coordinator and an injury to the wide receiver one if everyone agreed on what the ceiling was and these are the cards that he's been dealt shouldn't this kind of be the expected output sounds like an excuse because it sort of is and in the grand scheme of things it won't totally matter why he failed just that he failed maybe all this is obvious but i don't feel like i hear a holistic view of this a lot yeah i mean i think some of that goes oh by the way if you want us to read your comment starting with flattery we'll get you a long way so that was that was a solid <laughs> oh i had to yeah. include that before i actually yeah, got to yeah the yeah that's, that's, so yeah <laughs> yeah if you want to get your comment read yeah, just tell us how great we are that's that's a good start uh but i think um i think there's a lot of truth to that comment that this you know but i also think we saw things that kenny pickett individually was doing mm-hmm. worse this year than last year. And so yeah. it's double barrel, right? Where like if the rest of the offense was better and there was less pressure on Kenny, maybe people would notice it as much. Maybe the team would be doing better, but there's plenty of things that we've pointed out here. The accuracy issues early, some of the decision-making uh, the bailing on the clean pockets that looked 
either no better or actually worse than what we saw from him last year. And so I do think that that sort of downturn in, in optimism is rational. I don't, I don't think it's, it's made up. I, you know, or, or, or the, uh, the fruit of unrealistic expectations. He was better mm-hmm. at some things than last year than he's been this year. And that's why there's a lot of noise about Kenny Pickett. In addition to the offense struggling in general and, and all these other things that, that we talked about, but I, I think it's, it's both. I think there is some realty re- realness to it. Uh, and I, I do, but I do agree that like, if you just get Kirk Cousins is another great example, Ryan Tannehill, out of Kenny Pickett for the number 20 draft pick. That's probably a real, that's, that's a, that's a fine result. If you're looking at things from a pure, like what, what you spent, what you got uh, accountant level standpoint. The problem is, is that the rest of his team is not good enough for that to equal team success. And so they need yeah. him to be more. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe I'm looking at this uh, glass half full at this point, a little bit of hopium on my part as a Steelers fan, but we saw less than three quarters against a San Fran team that looks like the best team in football. And it was in week one of this offense together before Deontay Johnson got hurt. So I'm really curious as to what this team is able to do offensively with him back into the fold. And again, you're going to have Pat Frymuth for at least, uh, we think one more week, but we'll see there. I, they just haven't had like that full complement of players either. So uh, I'm curious as to what that could look like when that is the case. I think Deontay Johnson is a quarterback's best friend. And so not having a guy like that, who's always open has certainly impacted Pickett's ability to do his job. Um, And that's something we definitely need to be taking into consideration when we look at what he's done so far. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Alan, maybe uh, before we get out of here, before we tell tell the people where they can find us, maybe set the parameters as to what tomorrow's show is going to look like and what to expect. So tomorrow, 10,000 subscriber celebration here for the YouTube channel. Um, If you're not watching on YouTube, tomorrow you want to be because we are going to be live on YouTube. And let's just nail down a time here. We haven't actually talked about this. but We have have not, so we're going to do it in real time. I do want to do five. I feel like five is the time where we, like most people are done with work by five o'clock. If you're not, like just tell your boss to buzz off. Like you got important stuff to do, like <laughs> listening to the entire theme song to Steelers Afternoon Drive and yeah. maybe winning some stuff. So we are giving away a whole laundry list of things, and we are uh, including a jersey. Ooh, should I um hmm. should I this would be I... the last one that we say who it's not if you're gonna do that, or you say who it is. It is not a player that was in the NFL in 2022. Okay. I believe that if you've listened to everyone I've said who it's not, you should know who it is. Unless like I picked. Wow. Alan. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. It's, it's also not Brad wing. Yeah. Uh, I believe I have given all the necessary clues to to get you to who it is. But if you have not been a faithful viewer, we'll let you know tomorrow what jersey you're going to win. So here's what you got to do. You got to leave a comment on this post, or you can comment in our live stream tomorrow up until we start to give stuff away. And we'll just use the total number of comments and a random number generator and we'll pick winners. We are giving away a jersey. We're giving away a pullover. We are giving away a tassel cap, some socks, a ball cap. We got some uh, We got some beef jerky. We got some, some subscriptions to Steelers Now Plus. Uh, so all kinds of stuff. And uh, then we're also going to pick, and you can comment whatever you want, any comment. I don't care. But we're going to give one thing away. We haven't picked which one it will be. One thing, Smitty and I will pick which the best comment uh, we'll, we'll, we'll win something and then all the rest of them will be random. And that's, that's how we're going to go. Love so it. any, so, any yeah. comment it could be anything be here tomorrow, 5 PM Eastern time for people yeah, that are not Eastern East, time, yes. East coast, uh, Eastern time. Uh, so be here. If you are typically somebody that listens to the show on an audio platform, make sure that this is the one that you do watch. We will be here live. You do not want to miss it uh set hit that notification bell because you'll know when we go live as well so like subscribe hit that notification bell like we always say it is for this purpose if you hit that notification bell 
you will get a little alert when we go live. Um, Alan, tell the people where they can find you. At a Saunders underscore PGH on X at PGH Steelers. Now is the site's account Steelers now.com. That's where the words live. Read them so I can get paid 10% off Steelers now. Plus use my promo code Allen 10 like, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And we'll have another one of these when we hit another big round number. There we go. I can't even imagine what 20,000 is going to look like. Uh, might be popping. I don't, I don't drink anymore, but I would say champagne. Maybe some of that, uh, What's this? Is it like sparkling juice? Is that the uh, what people drink on like New Year's and stuff? The kids and stuff. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe we could like get you an old duels or something like that. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right. Uh, I'm Zachary Smith, PGH. Like Alan said, like, subscribe, notification bell. If you're listening somewhere else, be sure to leave us a five star review there. But again, tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern, right here on the YouTube channel, we will be live for the 10,000 subscriber. I don't. What do we call it? Super Show Bash extravaganza something Steelers now uh viewer appreciation day that's there we go. that's that's what we're going there we go and again all the comments should start out telling Alan and I how great we are and then the rest if the you comments. want it read that's that's really uh, a good way to go about it but definitely comment today comment tomorrow on the live stream and we'll go from there and we will see you then thanks for jumping in take another ride on the Steelers afternoon drive we